diesel engine. I'm going to set down the top, guys. I hope nobody minds. Oh, you mind? All right, so you guys all know who I am. Uh, What's your name? If you don't, you should. I'm Brad Moss. <laughs> uh, quick question. I was hoping to get everybody over here. All right, so uh, I, I think I know the answer, but how many of you currently own a Citroën? Yay. All right, that's pretty good. All right, so, so how many of you owned a Citroën 10 years ago? Oh, now they're starting to fall. How about 20 years ago? Oh, we still got them, hands coming up. How about 30 years ago? All right, we got we got a few. All right, how about 40 years ago? Oh man, I'm not that old. Barely alive. All right, so uh, so did so uh, yes, I did. did. Okay. Yeah, I'm old. All right. So uh, so how how about how many of you work on Citroens 42 years ago? <laughs> Uh, well, I guess uh, it look, looks like uh, there's only one person that, that owned or worked on Citroens uh, in 1975. Uh, I guess I'm going to be able to get away with whatever I want to tell you, because nobody's going to know the difference. All right, so uh, it takes the pressure off of me. All right, so anyhow, this crazy quiz that I put together, uh, I was actually quite surprised by some of the things I found out. I was very, very uh, fortunate. The uh, the earliest Citroen factory USA parts book that I had in my possession was from the mid 80s. I mentioned to a friend of mine who was a Citroen dealer and uh, repair shop in San Francisco back in the day. Uh, by the name of Don Garriott, who is now retired, but still works on a lot of Citroens. I think he's uh, about 80 years old. Um, he sent me a factory, USA factory parts book that is dated um, February 1st, 1975. So that's, that is probably as early a parts book as I was going to find. So I appreciate him doing that. Um, as I noted on this quiz, the current prices are actually what I sell the parts for today. Um, I, I like to think that I'm probably the very competitive with my pricing compared to anyone in this country. Uh, there's no way uh, in H that myself or anyone else who imports parts here could compete with prices in Europe. And that's just how it works. Because, uh, Unless I'm gonna make do on my looks, I gotta make a little bit of money. You wouldn't make it on your looks. Yeah, you got it, buddy. <laughs> Keep on doing what you do. All right, so so how many of you thought that the wordy uh, on brand new intro in parts was a year? All right, so how, how about 90 days? That's 90 days is how long they were born. Oh, I guess 30. <laughs> All right, so so 90 days. Now here, here's the uh, here's the other interesting thing that I, I would have never dreamed, and uh, and maybe I'm doing it wrong because I usually, if somebody buys a part from me today and they don't put it on their car for 30 days, I usually try to give some leeway. Uh, the next question, the warranty is stated in this book that it begins on the date the part was invoiced by Citroen to the dealer. Oh, that sucks. So if, <laughs> if the dealer bought a part and put it in stock for 30 days or 90 days, or in some cases for five years, they were SOL because the dealership wasn't, apparently was not going to get reimbursed for warranty. Wow. Um, how many of you uh, guessed what number for uh, how many distribution de depots Citroen had in North America? I said two. I said two. Two. There's a three. Three is the number. And uh, there was one on the East Coast in New Jersey, there was one in California, and there was one in Montreal. Well, that was in not U.S. Uh, no, no, I said in North America. Oh, my God. You got to read. 
Drake and Question. Drake and Question, please. All right, so uh, how about 1975 price for LHM? 375. I wish it was a dollar ninety-five. Four dollars and twenty cents. Oh. Oh. So, so when you look at how much LHM is today, which is the next question, I retail it for sixteen fifty. Yeah. And uh, when you look at the how much the the dollar has uh, changed in value, four dollars and twenty cents was not exactly cheap. Uh, I would not doubt that you could buy Dexron fluid for less than a dollar a quart back then. That's why everybody used it. And that, that's, again, why... Uh, now, here's another interesting one, and uh, uh, probably more people are going to know the answer to number seven than to number six. Uh, what do you think a, a Weber carburetor hose costs today retail? Anybody? $97.49. I'm good with that. Okay, and that that is... Uh, not cheap, but I guess we're lucky that they actually make a reproduction part. Mm. How much do you think one was in 1975? And may maybe we all should have bought a hundred of them. Fifteen seventy-three dollars. Six dollars and forty-four cents. Can you imagine that? So, uh, how about a DS oil filter? How many of those have you bought recently? Uh, I'll tell you right up front that my price is probably the cheapest in the country at thirteen fifty a piece. Um, how many times uh, is that that what they were in nineteen seventy five? Three times. Really? Three times as much. Uh, how about a piston liner set? Any guesses? Probably four. Two and a half times. Yeah. Actually, the price of piston liner sets has gone down uh, from probably about eight hundred to nine hundred dollars five years ago, and they're now uh, probably in the neighborhood of about six hundred dollars or a little bit less. Where does it mean? China. Uh, no, they're. Uh, uh, I don't doubt that they're probably manufactured in Eastern Europe. Uh, but that's coming out of Europe, and uh, it's good, good, good quality, okay. good quality with a good warranty. Um, all right, how about a uh, fuel pump? Now you you got to remember that the the uh, sort of the uh, what we've been seeing uh, DS fuel pump today only cost about twice what it did back then, which you would have thought it would be a lot more than that. Uh, for a DS21, they're probably about $75. Uh, how about a pressure plate? <laughs> Dave Agar knows the answer to this, baby. Uh, a rebuilt pressure plate today, a good quality one out of Europe, which is the only place to get them, is five times what the what the price was for a brand new factory part. Well, I want a factory part. Well, it's a rebuilt versus a new. Um, all right, so say you went to your dealer, and, and I find it sort of funny that they even have a list price on this. What would it have cost you to have bought a five gallon, five gallons of LHM in 1975? 72 bucks. All right, so uh, how many of you bought, have bought spheres lately for a D model? Uh, anybody have a guess on a pair of spheres? Dave knows the answer to this. <laughs> what, 186 a pair. But you know what? That same pair in 1975 for factory spheres, of course those, those are uh, aftermarket. They probably come out of the same factory that Citroen's using. But uh, a pair of DS spheres in 1975 was $130. So you, you think in 1975 that was a lot of money, an awful lot of money. Um, how about an exhaust system? Anybody have any guesses for a uh, for the front to back except for the downpipe? 185. 155. 155. Wow. And that's no jive. <laughs> he bought two of them. And how how about today? How many times that? Roughly. Twice. Three, three, times. three, four, three, four. <laughs> three and a half. Three and a half. And that's for uh, that's for steel. If you go for stainless steel, you don't even want to hear it. Big uh, bucks. 
All right, so uh, an upper radiator hose for a DS21, and again, my price is cheaper than on the West Coast, $111. How much do you think one was in 1975? Five 15 bucks. bucks. $35.95. Nine dollars. Yeah, George, you were there. <laughs> yeah, you know, George wasn't ever here when I was asking the questions. George was driving a DS when I was uh, 15 years old, I think, right? Working, so I, I was know. working. I started there when I was 15. So you've had you've had a Citroen on and off for 42 years, 40 years at least. Um, how about a rebuilt short block for an SM, all you SM people? Uh, how much do you think one of them was in 1975? $2,800. Nope. $3,750. Really? Oh, so that was a pretty expensive engine in 1975. Uh, if, if you want real sticker shock, Dave, how much would a short block cost today to rebuild? Five grand? At least. <laughs> probably, probably more than that. The, the last number that I heard for a rebuilt engine on the West Coast was probably like thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars, and that that yeah, well, that's had to raise price. Uh, that, but <laughs> but you know, yeah, we definitely for an SM engine, it's eight to nine thousand. Yep. Really? All right. Uh, okay. So, uh, how about a tinted windshield for an SM? Oh. Try, try to get one of them today for less than a thousand bucks. Yeah, I'll have the other one. Two hundred and ten dollars. Why can't I buy it? There's probably some screw warehouse somewhere that wants to do But if you had a lowly D model, you could buy one for hundred and forty dollars. Okay. And and right now they they can retail around four hundred dollars. I think I got John a deal on one for three hundred, maybe. Yeah, you could get three fifty or something. Yeah, three or three fifty. But you got to know where to get them, and you got to be patient because. They're not always available. Made in Israel? Uh, no, they're the last. One. I'm not sure. I don't. I didn't see his look at it. May have been made in Australia. Yeah. Uh, Pil Pilkington glass. Uh, I could take you over and show you Pilkington glass in my new Honda, and that's who's making a lot of the reproduction windshields. Mm. But again, it's hit or miss when they're available. Um, how about a new ring and pinion for your five-speed SM? I don't even know that I could find one of them today. Maybe. Maybe from uh, Harry Martins. Maybe. Uh, any guesses on that? 165. You got it. Oh. I got one way back <laughs> when oh, New Jersey, they had, and what was the guy's name? He had an SM2. Okay. Uh, I well, forgot the name. You're probably I, talking about Paul Ivis. Paul Ivis. That's the one. <laughs> That's the one. I spoke to Paul Ivis within the last month. Is he's, that right? He's retired in South Carolina uh -huh. and uh, doing pretty well. I I got steal the bill for the. Uh, <laughs> All right. So cheating. so how much do you think one was was for a uh, for a four speed DS21? Probably the same because it's the same gear. Hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. Well, this guy. Uh, all right, so here's here's an interesting one that sort of shocked me. Uh, uh, Michelin tires. If if you were used to driving a D model and then you bought an SM, how much more did an SM tire, factory tire, cost for your SM than for your DS21? I would say $100. Seventy dollars. Seventy dollars, which I guess compared to today is not that bad. Now, uh, how much more? Yeah, how much more? Not seventy dollars a piece. Um, four doors for a seventy-two DS twenty-one. Uh, today, I hate to say what it would cost to get reproduction, and you might be lucky enough to get door skins or maybe a, a whole reproduction door. How many? How much for four new doors from the factory? Four twenty-five. Five hundred and seventy-five dollars. Very cheap. All right, and uh, how about a rebuilt five-speed gearbox for a SM? Again, I wish I'd have bought a few back then. <laughs> Seven seven hundred and fifty dollars exchange. And I think there was a whopping fifty-dollar core charge if I remember right. Hey Dave, we want to know how much that is. 
All right, so here's the bonus question. Uh, what what part that is sold today is uh, only 15% different than the price of what it would have been in 1975? Nope. Brake disc. Really? Front brake disc for an SM and D model huh. are basically not very much more than they were back then. How much is that? Uh, I'd have to look it up, but I think they're uh, about a hundred dollars a piece right now. You know, a hundred bucks a roller doesn't seem outrageous for today, but back then that would have been astronomical. Yep. How many hours it take to replace the rollers? Yeah, it's a day job, long day job. So I mean, you probably you would have had even back then, five hundred bucks to a brake job. All right. So anyhow. Um, now we have an idea of changes that have taken places uh, with parts prices. Uh, I'd be amiss if I didn't discuss about availability. Um, you know, Citroen was required by federal law, I think, back then to provide parts and, and support for the vehicles for seven years. Uh, and I think that was the case back then uh, after sales ended for that model. I mean, Citroen would they could have completely pulled out of this market around 1980. Uh, my feeling is that one of the reasons they didn't do that was because their parent company, uh, which was then Peugeot, was still in this market. And Citroen parts were marginally available from Citroen until at least the mid-80s. And again, I have that 1986 uh, factory U.S. Uh, parts uh, book that proves that they were at least selling parts in the mid 80s. Um, I wasn't very involved with buying or, or selling parts in the mid 80s. I was busy repairing cars, uh, mostly Peugeots, I hate to tell you at that point. Uh, but there were a few uh, retail and wholesale Citroen spark parts specialty suppliers in the USA who actually became more cost effective uh, to buy parts from than buying them through Citroen. Um, after Peugeot stopped selling cars here in 1991, think about how long ago that is already, uh, Peugeot really downsized, and especially after that seven year period. Um, sometime before I left the dealership, which was the end of 1993, Citroen officially closed their warehouse in New Jersey I think the one in California had closed long before that. Um, and uh, How about in Montreal? I'm not in, I have no idea about <laughs> Montreal. Uh, but anyhow, the uh, the gentleman that he mentioned uh -huh. was the one of the last people who actually were in the warehouse. Uh, he was originally a factory uh, service rep who traveled around and uh, took care of warranty and all that kind of stuff. But he was the last one who was actually dealing with the parts in the warehouse. Uh, and he told me that the, the word came down from the top that they were going to lease the warehouse or sell it or whatever, and it needed to be empty. And there was no, no discussion about how long it was going to take. It needed to be empty. Um, Red Dellinger traveled to New Jersey. I don't really remember how he got there. I would imagine he probably took the bus, uh, which was pretty common in those days. Um, and I'll mention about that, when uh, the last couple years that we were selling Citro in, uh, the cars weren't brought in on car, car carriers. Red would take a handful of guys, they'd take the bus to New Jersey, um, get and get a taxi, they'd go to Lyndhurst, and they'd drive them home. And, uh, and one, of the, uh, one of the things they all learned very quick was to uh, set the parking brake so that you could use it as a foot brake uh, and it wouldn't lock so that when they went through a speed trap they could slow down without the brake lights coming. <laughs> so needless to say we were adjusting parking brakes before the car went out. But any, anyhow, Red rented a, uh, a lar one of the largest straight body uh, rental trucks that you could get and came back to Lewisbury with its stuff full of Citroen parts. Um, I have no idea what kind of a, of a deal they struck, how, whether they're, I'm sure there was money that changed hands, 
I have no idea how much or, or what did he go? How, he but uh, I don't know. I would imagine that Paul Hivis, uh made some kind of a deal, but I couldn't tell you that, and I, I don't know that he would either. But I, I can tell you that a huge number of parts came back to Lewisbury. Uh, but I can also tell you that a fair number of parts uh, ended up going to the Citroen reps place where he lived also. And I've, I've bought parts from him as recently as a year ago. And he still had brand new factory parts sitting in his house. Um, but that, that was basically, as far as I know, the end of any Citroen parts inventory in the United States by Citroen themselves. However, Peugeot, uh, when they quit selling out of their warehouse, uh, which would have definitely been later than that, or maybe about that same time, they used Caterpillar, who was based in Allentown, as their parts distribution company. So if you ordered a Peugeot part, it came in a Caterpillar box from their warehouse. Uh, and the word was that if you if you got a hold of the right people at Peugeot, or, or uh, they actually had a presence in New York City, I think, Citroen did, uh, you might be lucky enough to get some LHM or something like that, but that, there wasn't very much else. Um, Thank you. And, and Dave might know this the answer to this. I'm not really sure, but I think that maybe the, the last officially recognized Citroen service point in the United States was probably Jerry Hathaway. And, and I don't know how that worked, but I know that Jerry did advertise that he was still an authorized Citroen service point for many, many years. Uh, uh, so I don't know at what point he was unable to, to order parts definitely directly from Citroen. So if, after I opened my business in 1994, I'd 